Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I was going to say gentleman, because there's one gentleman over there, but another bloke's joined us, because there's only a few blokes in the joint, uh, and that's probably appropriate given the topic of the day. Um, welcome, everybody. My name's Terry Slevin. Uh, I'm Director of Education Research at the Cancer Council, WA. We've been doing this Cancer Update series now for 20 years, and its idea is a fairly simple one. That is, there's research going on into cancer all the time, and things are changing as we learn new things. Um, Many of you support the Cancer Council and the work that it does by contributing through fundraising efforts and so on, and a lot of those funds do go into research. But there's no point in that research being done unless it translates into what we know and what we do about cancer. And to some extent, this Cancer Update series, for us at least, is about building that bridge between the researchers and what they find out about cancer and what the community knows and does about cancer. There's an endless series of topics that we have opened to us when it comes to the Cancer Update series, and that's why the evaluation forms that you're all that are thrust into your hands as you come through the, the door today um, is something we take seriously. We invite you to give us feedback about the t kind of things you'd like to hear about in this Cancer Update series. Um, we're also interested to know how you heard about the, the lecture today so we can make sure that we get the communications and marketing right to the right people. So you're very welcome to come along today and we're delighted that you're here and here to help us uh, advance what people know and do about cancer. Very important part about uh, what we do is trying to make sure we get across the information in the right time and in the right way and I'm delighted with our speaker today and I'll talk to you about him in a moment. But the tip that I have to always remember, if you can grab your mobile phone, if you've got it anywhere, it's embarrassing when it goes off, it's happened to me. So while I'm saying it, I'm doing it and I'm going to turn the ringer off. So my suggestion, is, and Ian's going to do the same thing. <laughs> See, I love it when these reminders work. Um, I'm going to introduce you to uh, a friend and colleague of the Cancer Council for more than 20 years. Professor Ian Hammond will be talking today about cervical cancer screening and, and the changes to that program that has been driven by science. Uh, Ian, is, we're just talking about his retirement, which kind of took into effect in 2012 after 30 years of clinical practice as a gynaecological oncologist here in Perth. Uh, in 2008 and 2009, he was the director of the Western Australian Cancer and Palliative Care Network. He's a clinical professor in the School of Women's and Infants Health uh, and the School of Anatomy and Human Biology at the University of Western Australia. Uh, he has a string of credentials to his bow, and I'll just give you a bit of a window into some of them. He's a past chairman of the Australasian College of Gynaecological Oncologists uh, and of the Oncology Committee of the uh, Royal Australian New Zealand College of Oncolo Oncological Gynaecologists. He's a member of numerous state and national committees and was chair of the Guidelines Review Group that developed the 2005 National Health and Medical Research Council Guidelines for the Management of Abnormal Pap Smears in Australia. Uh, most recently, he's the chair of the steering committee for the renewal implementation project that has oversight for bringing the proposed changes for cervical cancer screening into everyday clinical practice. He's a string of credentials to his name, but basically, Ian's a good bloke who tries to do the right thing and has helped a lot of women over his 30 plus years of uh, medical practice, and this is stuff he knows a hell of a lot of about. So I ask you to wel welcome, join me in welcoming Ian. Thank you, thank you, oh, gosh. thank you, Terry, for the very kind introduction. It's uh, nice to be back among friends. One of the things about retirement is that uh, you could just fall off quietly and never, never sort of turn up again anywhere. And I think this was sort of a life-saving project for me in many ways when I stopped, because the first thing I did when I stopped was carry on working in this domain. So it was quite nice. But otherwise, I travel the world with my wife and have a good time. So it's really good fun. For those of you that have to leave early, the answer to the question, is this the end of the pap smear, that's yes. So that's the end of that. So anybody who needs to leave now, you can go and you can sort of send you, send you something by dispatches. Now, George Papanicolaou devised the pap test back in 1928, and it didn't come into practice until around the late early 50s, in fact. It took a long time to get through the medical fraternity who reject everything when something comes up straight away. How many people know what a pap test is? Just put a hand up. That's just hands. Okay, I won't ask anybody if they've had one, because that's okay, but it doesn't matter. I think the important thing at the moment is that you know what it is. Now, what's coming? In 2016, it is very likely that we will have a complete change in the system. Right now, you have a, a PAP test taken from the cervix every two years from the age of 18 to 69. 
it is proposed that we change the test to a five-yearly test looking for HPV, which is human papillomavirus. And we know that human papillomavirus, HPV, is the cause of cervical cancer. So if you find the virus, you've got an alert to the presence and possibility of cells that could lead to cancer. And five-yearly is just as effective, in fact, more effective than doing it two-yearly with a pap test. It's better. We're going to raise the age of starting from 18 to 25 so 18-year-olds will no longer be part of it or will start at 25. And it actually, we'll, we'll, we'll invite people to the age of 69, but we'll continue the program. They won't leave the program to the age of 70 to 74. So they'll be a bit older when they finish the program, which is protective and saves life. And the other thing at the moment, you've heard of this, the cervical screening registers, which remind you about pap smears and when to go for a pap test. Well, that's a reminder system. We're actually going to have an invitation system. So at the age of 25, you get a letter saying, please come along and have a test. And when you're due for the next one, you get another letter saying, please come along. Not a reminder or a safety net, an actual invitation. And that's very important. So they're the main things that's going to happen. What does this mean? It means that you're going to have less cases of invasive cancer of the cervix, and you're going to have less deaths from invasive cancer of the cervix. Putting that into real numbers for Australia, in Australia every year we have about 750, 770 new cases of cervical cancer. We have about 220 deaths from cervical cancer. We'll get something like 100 less cases and about 30 to 35 less deaths, which has got to be a good thing. And that's just by changing to a five-yearly new test using HPV rather than the pap test. That's not to say the pap test hasn't been very good. It's been fantastic but this will do it better and smarter and more efficiently. So what I'm talking about today, and you may think I've probably finished by now, but I haven't, this is just to give you a sort of an overview, is I'm going to tell you a little bit about the current program and why it needs to change, why we need to renew it, a little bit about HPV and how it causes cervical cancer, so you have an understanding of it, something about the process by which we renewed the program and got to these new recommendations, just so you know it was a sort of real thing and wasn't just plucked out of the air. Um, then looking at the outcomes and options about what we're going to do and what does this mean for you as women and what does it mean for the partners of women because they often have to sort of bear the brunt of some of all of this. And then there are some concerns about young women. Maybe they're not going to have these tests early on. Is that safe? And the answer is yes, it is safe, but I'd like to tell you why it's safe. And what about older women? There was some concern. Originally, we were going to stop this program at 64 years of age, like the United Kingdom. And in fact, we've found that that's not safe. And that's why we're stretching it out. Older women come in, there'll be actually more protection for older women and look at some of the opportunities for the future. Now, I was told to warn you about gory pictures. Close your eyes at this point if, you, if you're not looking. That's, that is an invasive cancer of the cervix. I think I can show you. This is the cervical cancer here. Oh, this has stopped working now, that's okay. You can see the big cervical cancer thing in the middle, and that's the uterus sitting above it, that's a radical hysterectomy specimen, and that is what we're trying to prevent. Not find it, prevent it. And that's really the main thing there. This has actually stopped working. I see the battery, so can I give you that back? Is it working until perhaps it stops? No, it's not working until it do anything. It's just given up. That's okay, I'll press the button here. Something over here will work. That's okay, let's have a look. Yeah. So don't worry. Maybe if you've got another battery, terrific, but if not, don't worry about it. This is a worldwide problem. Now, you can see the colour scheme here. And the colour scheme is that if you've got a light colour, you're very good. And if you've got a dark colour, you're very bad. Now, about 530,000 women a year will get cervical cancer in the world. And remember, this is a preventable disease. If you had a pap smear every two or three years in the world, you'd stop this, basically stop this disease. And 250,000 women die of cervical cancer every year in the world. We have a very small number of women dying in Australia. We have very, very good statistics, if you like. Now, since 1991 in Australia, we've halved the incidence and halved the mortality or death rate from cervical cancer. So it's been a fantastic program. We started the organised approach to cervical screening, where we have registers to remind people to come for screening in 1991, and it's been very, very effective. You can see that the cervical cancers have changed slightly in their proportion. Most of the cervical cancers arise from that bit that's in a lower circle, which is blue, and that's the edge of the cervix there in the central part of the canal. We call that the transformation zone, and that's where the cancers arise. 
And there's slight different proportion. The squamous cancers now come out for 65%, and that's an ordinary skin cancer, just like you get a skin cancer from the sun. It's like that. And the glandular cancers, or adenocarcinomas, are slightly increased in proportion to about 25%. But the saddest thing is the fig figure at the bottom here, this bit, that 80% of Australian women who get cervical cancer today will never have had a pap smear or have lapsed with their pap smear program. Now that's very hard because they're not participating in the program. They can't be helped almost. They're beyond help unless they take part in the program. No, that's, that's dead again, so we won't worry. It's okay. I'll, do, I'll use this. So what do we do now? What do we do in Australia right now? We have a pap smear. We offer it from the age of 18 to the age of 69 or 18, the starting age, or within a year or two of becoming sexually active. Not all women are sexually active at 18, but in fact 50% of girls at the age of 16 are sexually active today. And that's been going on for quite a few years. We offer it every two years to the age of 69, and then there's a reminder system, a safety net system if you fail to have it. But you don't get on the register unless you have a smear. You can't, you can't get there unless you've actually had one. The difference in the future will be you'll be invited to be part of it all rather than just be reminded. So what does the cervical screening registry do for you in Western Australia right now? Most women are on the register if they've ever had a pap smear. You can opt off the register if you've got some reason you just don't want to have your data collected for whatever reason, but it really it's a silly thing to do because it's a great to have a reminder and it saved a lot of lives, I think, doing it. But what happens? Well, the, the registry acts as a safety net, basically. It collects data. Doctors can find out about their results. Women can ring up the register and say, I've got no idea what's happened to my results. Can you tell me what's happened? They can get that information. Um, nurses at hospitals can get these results. And so could the laboratories update their results if necessary. And how, do, how, does the reg, how does the data sort of get there? In the middle, you can see CSR of WA. Think of that as a building which houses the register. And you can see down the bottom, and I haven't got a pointer now, but I think we can manage, you can see where it says woman. Well, the woman is the person of interest. They go to their doctor. You can see healthcare provider just along there to the left. They have a smear test taken, and then that smear test goes from the healthcare provider to the top where it says pathology laboratory. It goes up there, and then the test is done. The results go back to the doctor that goes back to the woman, so the woman gets her information. But the other thing that happens is that from the laboratory, a little line goes to the big box in the middle, and that's where the registry gets the data and says, this woman had a pap smear on the 20th of July, 2014, and the result was this. So in 2016, they get a reminder if they don't turn up and have another one. And that's how it works. But you've got to be in it to be in it. You don't get there by accident, that's all. You can't get there by accident. It's a very, very efficient program. So this shows you graphically, you know, I've got very few graphs, so don't worry about data because I haven't got too much data. You can see here that this starts in 1991 when the organised approach to screening started with the register. And you can see here the red line is squamous cancer of the cervix. It's so many cases per 100,000 women, which is how we describe the data. And you can see that in 1991 it was about 13 cases for every 100,000 women in Australia. And now, in fact, it's actually 5.6 for every 100,000 women in Australia. So it's a terrific reduction. The mortality rate back then was about 7 or 8. Now it's just 1.6, 1. 1. very, very low. So it's a terrific result. You'll notice the red line has done very, very well, but it's flattened out towards the latter years. And if you extended that from 2005 to 2014, it just carries on just the same. It hasn't had much more improvement. It's done very well, but not improved anymore. The blue line, you can see the dotted one running along there, is the glandular cancer. And you'll notice that that hasn't had any change at all. We do pick up some glandular cancers, but not sufficient to make a difference to the overall incidence data. So can we do better with that? And in fact, the HPV testing will pick up the glandular cancers rather than the cells. So we think it's quite remarkable and very good. So we all know about a pap smear. Now, the women here who have had a pap smear won't need to be reminded of what it's all about. But for those of you that have never had a pap smear, or the men in the audience who have never clearly haven't had a pap smear, I hope, the, um, we, can, we can share with them what that's about, and the women can sit here and smile now at this point and say, you never had it so lucky, guys. This is a speculum that goes inside. Sorry, that's one back one. So this is sort of the kit. You can see the speculum there, the plastic speculum on the left. 
Um, and then you've got a little stick or brush arrangement and a slide, and basically you've got to get into the cervix through the vagina and then take a, a specimen from the neck of the cervix and then put it onto a slide. It gets fixed and goes to the laboratory to be looked at for cells. So this is the speculum going into the vagina to find the cervix. And then once you've found the cervix, you take a little brush sample from the cervix. That then comes out. It sounds terribly simple, doesn't it, if you're not having it? And then you get cells like this. And these are squamous cells, looked under the microscope. Lovely cells, nice clear picture, very pretty slide, little, little black nuclei. They're normal, completely normal cells. By contrast, if you had an HPV infection on your cervix, your cells would look a bit like this. They'd be all coloured, which is all very exciting, but the colours don't matter. You'll notice that the nuclei are slightly bigger, and some of the things have got... They're much bigger, actually, across there. And they're the classic cells of HPV. We call them coilocytes, and it doesn't really matter, just to show you that they're different. And then if you were to keep your virus infection and it becomes an abnormal cell, not just an infection cell, a pre-cancer cell, it would look something like this. You can see the contrast between the two. Very big black nuclei. And they, those cells, are high-grade squamous cells, and they are the ones that can lead to cancer of the cervix. That's what you're trying to detect, and that's what you're trying to eradicate, and that's what you want to prevent so you don't develop a cervical cancer. That's what the whole program is about. So what happens if you go and have a pap smear today and you get a result and it's abnormal? Well, it could be low-grade or it could be high-grade. If it's low grade, you'll be asked to have a repeat smear in 12 months. That's basically what happens. If it's high grade or any glandular abnormality whatsoever, you'll be asked to go and see a gynaecologist to have a colposcopy, which is a magnified look at the cervix. So it's a pretty simple process. That's a colposcope. I once asked a med the medical students, I said, what do you do? How do you do colposcopy? And they said to me, oh, you take a colposcope and you put it into the vagina. Yeah. Well... <laughs> That was, a, that was a bad moment. So we took, them down to the, we took them down to the clinic and I showed them the colposcope and, of course, this is one of the blokes that said this, of course, and the girls just fell about laughing and the, you know, the boys were very embarrassed. But that's a colposcope, which is basically a very expensive magnifying instrument. So instead of an ordinary pair of binoculars that cost 500 bucks, this cost 10,000 bucks to look at. And that's me back in 1988. And you'll notice immediately the black hair, which I no longer have. And uh, I didn't think I could do the Grecian 2000 job to get it going today. But certainly age catches up with you. But here you're looking through the speculum into the, into the vagina to look at the cervix. I'm going to show a few pictures of what it looks like. Just so You might be interested for those of you who've never seen it. And basically that is a normal, a part of a normal cervix. On the outer part to the left is the... Um, the normal cervical skin, and the inner part where there's like a black hole, that's part of the cervix, that's the central hole going into the uterus, and the, the bit in between is rather lovely, and that's called the transformation zone, and that's where the virus gets in and causes all the mischief. That's where the mischief is. That's like a dynamic area in the cervix, and that's where changes take place. So if changes take place and the virus stays there and doesn't go away, because nearly always the virus goes away, you get an infection, it's gone within 6 to 12 months. But if it doesn't go, it can produce something like this. And this is with acetic acid on the cervix. It's called acetowhite epithelium. And if you biopsy that, it shows very densely abnormal cells, which are the pre-cancer cells, something called CIN3, which you've probably heard about, but basically pre-cancer. And so you can take a biopsy, which is a very simple thing to do, for me anyway, and you can get a result like that, which is very abnormal cells. You can see they look like the ones that were on the pap smear before, and that's histology. So then you get a biopsy, and you make a diagnosis. And now I have got a gory slide. It's to show you what happens when you remove that big white area from the cervix. There'll be a brown area here. Don't worry about that. It's just iodine. It's not burn, just to let you know. But if you need to close your eyes now, now's a good time. So that is where you've scooped out, using a wire loop, the abnormal skin. It looks gory because of the brown stuff, but it is just iodine, really. And three months later, when you go back to look at this woman and check her over, it's normal. Now, you're not drunk. There are two pictures there, so it's OK. But we used to take the pictures. We used this to a stereoscopic thing. But you can see now the central area has regenerated, and it's healed completely. And this is 98% effective in getting rid of these abnormal cells. So it's a very, very effective program that we have right now. 
And after treatment, you have a, what we call test of cure, where you have a follow-up pap smear and a colposcopy. Then at 12 months, you have a pap smear and an HPV test. We now know that the virus is present, and we use a test. It's the only thing that's allowed for at the present time with the medical benefit schedule. You can get a rebate for this for money from the doctor, and you can have that test done. And when you have two negative results, you basically could be said you're clear, and you go back to routine screening. So you've been, you've been sorted out. You're not going to get cervical cancer, and that's really true. You've still got to be screened, but your risk now is very, very low. In 2005, I chaired a committee, which Terry alluded to, which produced this document, which was endorsed by the NH and MRC. And this is how we manage women who have abnormal smears. So if you have an abnormal smear today, this is the book which tells the doctors, if you like, what to do. Repeat the test in 12 months or go and see a colposcopist, then what to do if the results are abnormal. When this document was being looked at by the NH and MRC, they made some recommendations, and I remind you, it's 2005. And they said, that great document, well done, chaps, but why don't you have a look at your whole program and particularly look at the screening interval? Because right then and now, we do two yearly pap smears, and we start at 18 and we go to 69. And a lot of places in the world had changed what they were doing, and they were doing just as well as we were doing here in Australia in terms of cancer and in terms of lives saved and so on. So they said, well, maybe we don't need to be quite as intensive. To give you some idea of what we do in terms of turning up to have a pap smear, this graph shows you um, the participation percentage on the left going up and the ages along the side, but just the main graph lines. The lower line is how many women of the, the age range, 18 to 69, actually have a pap smear every two years. Well, it's about 50, what is it here, 56% have a pap smear every two years. That's not vast. But if you go to three years, it goes up to nearly 70%. And if you go to five years, 80% of the women in Western Australia will have had a pap smear, which is pretty good. It's the 20% I'm really worried about, the ones that have never had a pap smear, because they're the ones that actually get cervical cancer. So they're not protected, and they're a bit of a worry. But it shows you eventually most women turn up and have a pap smear. So the NH and MRC said, let's get on to this in 2005. In 2007, we had a meeting in Sydney where we all drank lots of coffee, with occasional glass of wine, and discussed how we were going to move forward. Nothing happened whatsoever. And in 2009, they announced that we would start the renewal of the National Cervical Screening Programme. Well, naturally, 2009, we all got very, very excited, and nothing happened whatsoever until the end of 2011. I was just about literally to retire from practice, and they rang me and said, would you chair the committee we've been talking about? I said, I'm retiring in two weeks. They said, that is perfect, perfect timing. You have so much time on your hands, you'll be able to give your time to this project. I said, the money's not good, I can tell you. You've got to have time. So I said, that's a good idea. Let's get on to it. So just to remind you, we've had a wonderful program. That arrow is 1991 when we started the program. You notice that people were having pap smears before that. There was a small fall already, but the organised approach with registries and reminder systems didn't start until 1991, and a tremendous, I think, effective program, and we're very grateful, really, to Papa Nicola and self, um, and also to the people who've run the laboratories and the cervical screening registers and everybody involved in getting women to have pap smears. So people would say, well, look, if this is such a good program, why on earth do you want to change it? You're doing so well. You've got some of the best figures in the country, in the, in the world, sorry. Well, the reason is we've got a lot of new evidence about how cancer of the cervix develops. We know about HPV. We've got a lot of evidence from around the world, different places that do it differently, different ages, different screening intervals, and they do it just as well. We know that we've got new technology now. We haven't just got the PAP test. We've got a thing called liquid-based cytology or liquid-based pap smears, if you like. Instead of, you take, still take the same test from the cervix, but instead of going onto a slide, it goes into a little liquid jar, and you can shake off all the cells, and it's a much nicer specimen. And that same fluid can be used to detect HPV. You can use it for two things. You can test for HPV, and you can test the cells, which is a double role. And you can't do that on an ordinary slide from, from the Papanikolaou test. Also, if you get cells in a liquid-based sample, you can use a computer to analyse it. You can just run it through a system and it'll say they're abnormal or normal, and that's actually very helpful and more effective. And also we've now got HPV testing that has become very sophisticated. But more than anything in this country and around the world where it exists, we've got vaccination against HPV, which causes this cancer. So automatically you get a reduction in the number of people that are ever going to get this cancer because you've immunised them against it. 
which is fantastic. So in that environment, we now know we have to do something better. In Australia, we're doing very well. At the bottom is the best in this graph, or this table. So at the bottom, Finland has an incidence rate of 4.3 per 100,000 women, and you'll see their death rate is 1 per 100,000 women. Now, Australia is very good, 5.5, 1.6. New Zealand is just ahead of us. We, see, we keep going topsy-turvy with New Zealand. They change every two or three years. They go up, we go down. It doesn't really make any difference. These are the best countries in the world, and you can see we're doing very well. So you say, well, we're doing so well, why change? Why change is because when you look at Finland, they start screening women at the age of 30, not 18, and they do it every five years with a pap test. Some of the jurisdictions in Finland start at 25, but most of them, I think 80% of them, start at the age of 30. So they start at 30, they do it every five years, and yet they're the best in the world. So we must be doing a bit more than is needed, and that's why we're looking at the programme and revising it to see if we can do it smarter. Now, George Papa Nicolau, when he devised the PAP test um, in 1928, he said, this is a great test, you've got to get onto it. The American physician said, forget it, I don't want to know about this, because they had vested interests. They didn't, weren't interested in preventing cancer so much. They thought they could do it just as well by the way they were doing it forever. And eventually, 20 years later, the American Cancer Society said, this is a good idea, we should do the PAP test. And gradually it became incorporated into the way we do things around the world, which is fantastic. Liquid-based cytology, which I mentioned before, is different to the pap test in that we don't just smear it on a slide, we put it into a jar. And you can see here, you're taking the sample from the cervix in the top left picture, and then that brush goes into the jar, you wiggle it around, you wash off the cells into the fluid, then you put a cap on the jar, and you send it to the laboratory. And the laboratory then processes this. This is a sample called ThinPrep, which is made by Hologic. There's another one called SurePath that comes from Beckton Dickinson. It doesn't matter, they're much the same. And there are two major things. I've just got the slides from Thin Prep. And this then goes into a machine, it shakes it all about, does whatever it has to do, and then puts it onto a slide for you. So it's a very clever process. And then either you can have a technician look at it, or it can go into a computer, and the computer will look at it and tell you what's going on. So it's a fantastic process, uh, I think. And here's the difference between the type of smears you can get from a liquid-based sample. The top left one is a standard pap smear screen. It's not always as dirty as this, but it doesn't matter. You can see the cells are in there, but they're very clouded by all the rubbish, a bit of blood and a bit of white cells. And then when you wash all the stuff off in the liquid-based, it's very, very clear, the bottom right one. So it's much easier to look at. And that's why the liquid-based sample has been used in the UK and America over the last few years. It took over completely. We haven't taken it over completely here because the standard of our smear taking is so high in Australia, we didn't have a lot of unsatisfactory smears. But these other countries had a very high rate of unsatisfactory smears. And they were asking almost 10% of the women to go back and have another smear. So they had to do something better. We don't have that. So we didn't have to do it. But there's certainly an advantage now for us moving towards it. So we have new technology. We have an old test called the pap smear, and a new technology liquid-based. And now we know that HPV, human papillomavirus, is the cause of cervical cancer. Harold Zerhausen demonstrated this scientifically in 1982. It took nine years for the scientific community to actually accept this information. But around in the late 80s, Ian Fraser, who many of you will know that name, he was the Australian of the Year in 2006, developed with his Chinese colleague the vaccine against HPV. Now, we know there are over 100 types of papillomavirus, and I just refer you to the elephant in the top right corner, and you'll see that even elephants get genital warts, which is a bit sad for elephants. However, if you look at the viruses, you'll see that not that many affect man, four groups. Genital warts are type 611. That's very common, genital warts. Genital warts don't cause cancer. That's just genital warts, and they can get treated and go away. But 16, 18, these different types of virus, all HPV, but different types... 16 and 18 account for 70% or more of all cervical cancers, and it's those two types that have been included in the vaccine. So even if you get vaccinated against 16 and 18 as a young girl, you're not protected against those other types. So you have to keep being screened. Your risk is very low, but you still need screening. We have lots of HPV tests available now, so we can do that, and that's quite interesting. I don't need to go into the detail, but we have many tests available and we have a lot of knowledge about the virus. The virus is that little ball that looks like it's got little sucker feet on it at the left. But what the scientists have done, and Ian Fraser in particular, they looked at the structure within the virus and they've developed what's called virus-like particles. And it's from that 
that they developed the vaccine. And in 2005, the clinical trials came to fruition and they went on to develop the vaccination program. The first program in the world, vaccination against HPV for girls, started in 2007 and for boys, 2013. A wonderful, a wonderful advance. And if only this was available in countries like Africa and India and the countries where you have this massive problem with cervical cancer, we could do much better. And he's trying desperately hard to try and get that into these other countries. And this is the vial of Gardasil, which we use to immunise uh, young women today at the age of 12 and 13. And it's very, very good. It's been shown, however, to be very effective. We've already got data from this. It's only 2014 now. It started in 2007, seven years ago. We've already got data showing there's reduced HPV infection in women, young girls. There's reduced high-grade abnormalities already in young women who have had the vaccine when they were younger. There's a 90% reduction in genital warts. And I know genital warts don't kill you, but they're very unpleasant. They're very unpleasant for women and men to have. And preventing that on its own is a very nice thing, I think, not to have that going on. And that's why the boys' immunisation and the girls will be very, very useful in the future. But the concern has been that public perception regarding screening may change. And there's already been a slight change of 2 or 3% in women who were vaccinated, girls who had been vaccinated in their teens, because there was a catch-up programme earlier on, they already are not turning up for pap smears under our current programme. They think they're immune already. They're fine. So there's an education programme you know, for this, and I know that people in the Cancer Council WA will be active in this and trying to get this message out there, because I think it's very, very important. And when you look at the vaccine and how it's been incorporated, we know that this is a slide that shows you what's happened in each state, and at the end on the right there's the national total. How many girls, when offered the vaccine at the age of 12 and 13, how many have completed three doses? That's what gives you the full cover. Well, you can see here that the Northern Territory is fantastic. About 84% actually get the full program. And in Tasmania, 62%. But the national average is about 70%. So we've still got 30% of the young women, they're not refusing the treatment usually. It's their parents who are refusing the treatment for them. And they've got to live with the consequences of that. So they have to make sure they get screened as well in the future. So we've got all this new information, all this new technology, everything going on, and that's why we have to rev revise the whole program. And here's a lovely slide from Ian Fraser himself. He loaned this to me some years ago, and I've reproduced it with permission. You have a normal cervix, you add HPV to the normal cervix, and you get a change there which you can see, l cell, which is a low-grade abnormality, just an infection of the cervix. That's all it is with a slide underneath it. And 98% of those changes, the infections, will go away within five years and 80% will be gone in a year. That's why you don't want to overdo it in young women, because in young women are the ones that get these infections, and then they're gone. So you don't want to mess around too much with them. But if it were to stay, a small area, the virus was to stay in the skin, over the next few years you can develop a high-grade abnormality, and it's that which turns into cancer of the cervix. Even some of those will go away, and particularly in young women, women that get this change in 20, 25 years of age, some of the high-grade changes go away. It's like having a bad cold or a mild cold or a bad cold. They still go away. But sometimes it goes on to cause flu or pneumonia, in which case it doesn't do you so much good. So if it goes on and it doesn't go away, you get cancer, and that can take 10 to 20 years to develop. We all know they can develop in a year or two, but it's very uncommon. It's normally 10 to 20 years, and we have two ways of dealing with it. One is we can detect the cancerous, precancerous change, that h cell change, and get rid of it, like I showed you in those pictures before, to stop it becoming a cancer. Or you can put a vaccine in and stop them getting infected in the first place. And obviously that's the best way to go if you possibly can. So with all that knowledge, we decided we have to renew the program. And the aim of the renewal is to make sure that all women in Australia, with a vaccination or not, get the best program according to the best evidence around at this time and that's what we aim to do in the renewal and basically what we wanted to do was to assess the tests and assess the interval and the age range put it all together and make it cost effective because I mean if it costs 50 billion dollars we're not going to do it it currently costs 200 million a year to run this program 200 million in Australia so it's quite a big program and we want to get it right the Renewal Steering Committee, which I had the opportunity to chair, was an expert committee. I was an expert when I started on this committee. I was a gynecologic oncologist. Now I'm an old has-been senior citizen, which is fine, and I'm no longer an expert, but I'm happy to be part of it all and help make it all happen. And we use the Medical Services Advisory Committee of the Australian Government, which is a very impartial, high-tech, high-level high committee, to assess the evidence once the evidence was gathered. 
We had a couple of meetings to sort out what we wanted to do. Now, I don't want to labour this slide. I wanted to show you just the top line. We had to put some things towards what could we do in the future. Shall we stay with what we've got, just change the age range and the interval? Shall we change to liquid-based cytology? That's scenario number two, LBC, and just change the age range, change the interval to three and five yearly, or shall we go completely mad and go to a totally different test, HPV testing every five years, something new? There's a lot of evidence in the world to suggest it's very, very good. So we put all the evidence together around those three different scenarios and some of the other stuff there, and we had it all assessed. The... University of Sydney team, Dr Sally Law, did the evidence assessment, and that's 400 pages. If you want to read it, the reference is coming up later, and you can certainly have a read of that. And then all that data was modelled for economy, how much does it cost, and how good is the outcome? How many women are saved by all of this? How many cancers are prevented? Because that's very, very important. It's no good having a great programme if it does worse. I mean, that's not going to be any help to anybody. So that had to be done. And we came up with a lot of tests. This is a pathway... And just to tell you, there were 18 different pathways like that assessed by the economic modelling teams. Each one of them had to be assessed with every single string of that and put together in a big computer and out come a load of data. But it's a very, very big and serious process. And what did it show? Well, what it showed at the bottom, and you can see where it says the second from the bottom, the HPV strategies, anything that did HPV testing as the primary test for every five years saved 18% in the cervical cancer rates. It had a better, lower rate of cancer, a lower death rate from cancer. If you stayed with the original, what we have now, the conventional cytology, and you changed the age from 25 to 64, you did it every three years and five years, you'd actually get more cancers. More cancers. Not because you start at 25, but because you stop at 64. And 64 is too soon to stop this program. You've got to take it on a bit longer. And that's why we changed all that and went on to 69 and 70 plus. If you use liquid-based cytology, it was very good. It did actually save cancers, but not as much as the HPV strategies. And the final line says, if you increase the age from 64 to 69, you will improve, you'll have less deaths by a rate of 5 to 7%. So we thought this was pretty compelling, and if there's nothing more compelling, I've never met a woman yet that is keen to have a pap smear. Not one, my wife just says, you know, it's that time, don't talk to me, sort of stuff, which is fair enough. And if I tell you that right now a woman starting at 18 and leaving at 69, the program will have 26 tests in her lifetime, by the new system you'll only have 9 or 10 tests every 5 years. So I think that's quite a compelling argument, as long as it's safe. That's very important. So while the Medical Services Advisory Committee, MSAC, were considering all this evidence and putting it all together, we had another few studies turn up just while we were waiting for them to consider it. And the top one is the one that's the most interesting. There was a pooled study from four very large randomised controlled trials that showed that HPV screening was 60 to 70 percent better at preventing cancer than ordinary cytology, the ordinary pap smear. And not only that, and I left it out here, it's better at preventing adenocarcinoma or glandular cancers, and that made it very, very compelling. So we sent all this to the uh, MSAC, and they said, we're happy to consider your evidence, but any changes must be as good as or better than what we have now. We will, will not accept anything that's worse. won't happen. So they deliberated. On the 3rd of April, they had a meeting. On the 28th of April, they produced a public document, and that is summarised for you here. They said... We, have, we want you to move to five yearly cervical screening. We want you to use a primary HPV test, not the pap smear, and with partial genotyping, looking for 16, 18 particularly, and the other high-risk types that are there. There are 14 of them. We then want you to, if you're positive for HPV, we want the same sample to be tested for cells. That means you don't have to come back for another visit. It just gets done at the laboratory straight away, so you don't have to worry about that, and you end up with a single result. It's for all women... 25 to 69, and then you'll be invited to leave the program a bit later on when you're, when you're normal. The other thing they suggested, which I haven't mentioned yet, is that if you never had a pap smear or were not keen to have a pap smear ever, there was a possibility of having self-collection, putting a swab in your own vagina and getting a sample, sending it off to the laboratory, and they would do it, except that it needs to be done in a healthcare facility. It's not like the bowel screen program where something's sent out to you at home and you do it at home and send it away. It needs to be done in a healthcare facility to make sure that it's all handled properly and there's no contamination. 
but that may be very helpful in bringing people into the program who've no long, who just refuse to have it done. And they say, I just can't do this. What has been shown is if a woman does agree to have this done and they then get a positive result, they are very keen to go and have the next test to take a slide, a sample, from the cervix. They, once they've got an abnormality, they're very keen to get it sorted out. They just can't get past that first step of having the examination with a speculum. So that seems to be quite compelling. And the other thing was about the invitations and reminders uh, system, which we think is terribly important. So what does this mean for you, the women here in, in present, and for the community? It means that you will be invited to have a test every five years. It will be an HPV test, not a pap smear, although from your purposes it's much the same. It's still something going in the vagina and a sample being taken. The sample will be taken from the cervix, sent to the laboratory, and if you need a subsequent what we call reflex cytology, it will be done there at the laboratory. You don't have to know anything about it. You will get a combined result. It might say HPV positive, cells negative, something like that, and then a recommendation about what to do. So the doctor will receive a report with all that information, giving some risk status and a recommendation, should you have a repeat test in five years, should you have it in one year, whatever it might be, or should you go and see the gynaecologist for a colposcopy. That will all happen in one step. But you must make sure you get your results. That's all I would say. I'll say that now, actually. This idea that if you don't hear from us, your test is all right is not good enough. You actually have to get a result somehow in writing or verbally that it is OK, because you can't assume that it is OK unless you know it. And the test will be recorded in the registry. And this is a pathway diagram. And don't get disturbed by this at all. Basically, you can see the test is at the top, HPV screening. And this is how you could move forward. On the left, you, if it's negative, you just come back in five years. On the right, if it's unsatisfactory for some reason, you ask to be retested. If it shows that you've got 1618, that sort of reddy brown thing, that has reflex cytology and you go straight to colposcopy. There's a range of things that can happen and the colour code in green, yellow, brown is low risk, intermediate risk and high risk. Anything with a high risk goes to colposcopy. Anything with intermediate risk often gets a repeat and anything negative comes back you know, in a few years' time for a test. So it's a pretty nice thing. So what about the young women? Well, there's some concern that young women no longer being screened from 18 to 25 will be disadvantaged by this program. And for those of you that have daughters, you may be concerned about this. You say, well, I, you know, I, I grew up with this program. I'm happy with it. Why don't we, you know, we're we going to suffer from this. Well, the UK moved to this program, similar, similar not, not, not HPV. They changed their age range back in 2004. And they have not found an increase in the women aged 20 to 25 of cancers at all. And in fact, in, the new, in Wales, Wales did not change their programme. They continued to screen at 20, and the UK, England changed to 25, and they have exactly the same rates. So there's nothing really much changed there at all. Screening's not very good for young women. HPV infection is incredibly common in young women, really common, and it goes away very quickly. And if you start finding HPV infection or abnormalities in young women, you will find something and you will treat it unnecessarily because it was going to go away, and that's really the problem. You're going to treat too many women. And if you treat the cervix with that picture I showed you, gouging out part of the cervix, you might remove some aspects of the cervical tissue that keeps the cervix competent for holding pregnancies in situ. So you don't want to be doing that in young girls unless you've got a very, very good reason to do it. And in fact, we think it's a very good idea. So starting at 25 reduces the overtreatment and minimises harms to women. And the vaccination programme is going to even more reduce things for these women. And there's been a recent paper, I mean, there's a lot of papers about this, but in the British Journal of Cancer, the English group from the Wolfson Institute, fantastic group, running the whole program, really, and looking at the data from the UK and around the world, they compared the benefits and harms of screening at the age of 20 and the age of 25. And what they came up with, just some broad data, they said, look, it's a society issue. If you, if you do 20 to 40,000 more tests and you do 300 to 900 more treatments, you might, and I emphasise might, prevent one cancer in a girl from 20 to 25. But the harms in terms of pregnancy loss and preterm labour, prematurity, they believe far outweigh any benefits in doing this to those women. Now, that is something the society has to make a decision about in the end, and the governments fund this programme, and they have to say, well, what's reasonable? And the people have to be happy with it across the board. 
For older women, they are absolutely going to benefit from this program. They're going to be screened a little bit longer and they're going to be protected longer as long as they have regular screening. Some people have said to me, well, what about a woman who wakes up one day, she's 73 years of age, she's never, ever, ever had a pap test, any other test in the world. She wakes up and thinks, today's my day, I'm going to have a test, I want to do this. I think that's really unlikely, I might tell you. That's not going to happen. But if it happens, she can pop along and see her GP and say, I want a test, and there's no reason why she will be denied that test. And likewise, remember, screening is for well women. It's women that don't have abnormal bleeding. They don't have bleeding after sex. They don't have bleeding after the menopause, in between periods or anything else. If a woman comes up with post bleeding after sex, postmenopausal bleeding, she can go and see the doctor any time, even at 22 years of age. doesn't matter. I've got abnormal bleeding, and they'll sort that out then and do whatever tests are needed. So it's not an exclusion thing. It's just saying well women don't need to be tested under the age of 25 and don't need to go much over 70, 74. And the self-collection, I just mentioned to you again, is only for people that are never had screened or under-screened. It's less effective, actually, than having a doctor take a sample. It's much more expensive than having a doctor take a sample, because it'll be a couple of visits. But it's fantastic if we can get the women that never have it to take part in the program, because we will prevent cervical cancer in that way. And you can see here, that left table is the incidence rate of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, 2004 to 2008, cervical cancer. It's four times, three to four times the rate of non-Indigenous women in Australia. And the mortality rate is four to five times the rate. The death rate is four to five times the rate for non-Indigenous women. For, for the Aboriginal women. So if we could get those women to come a bit earlier and do things and get screened, that would be a fantastic thing and it's something I'm quite passionate about. So, Mr Chairman, we will have 15% less and fewer cases of cervical cancer. We'll have less deaths from cervical cancer. The program has been costed to actually be about 20 to 25% less cost. Now, if that doesn't compel the government to say this is a good idea, I mean, less deaths, less tests and less money, what more do they want? And we hope they'll come to the party in September when they consider this. So in conclusion, the opportunities for this new programme, the renewal, are that we'll have less frequent testing, we'll have less cancers, and we'll have more lives saved. And I think you can stop there and say, well, that's a winner. I mean, no-one's going to reject that, I think, but you never know. We may have better participation by inviting people and then reminding people. And for those people that have never had a test, self-collection may be a very good way to go. The vaccination program will continue and hopefully get better as more and more people become aware that it's, it's OK, it's safe, people don't fall over when they have a vaccine, they'll be OK, and more and more women will be protected. And it, they tell me in about five to six years' time there'll be a vaccine that will cover nine types of cancer-related thing, which will cover 90% of the types that cause cervical cancer, the non-avalent vaccine. And when that comes, that'll really be a game-changer again. I'll have to revise the whole program because there'll be no one left, probably, with anything going on if they all get vaccinated. We'd like to have a national register. One woman, one record. So you in Western Australia, you pick up your sticks tomorrow, you go to New South Wales, they've never heard of you in New South Wales, they don't know who you are. If you have a national recording system, the data goes back and forwards, and your Medicare link, number and address will get you invited to be there. You won't just fall off the, off the planet, and hopefully there'll be better data collection. We had the first national HPV vaccination program. We had one of the first national cervical screening programs. We had the first vaccine. We certainly had the first school-based immunisation program. And we may get the first national cervical screening program using HPV, the Netherlands talked about this three or four years ago. They've been battling with it for a while. They're due to start in January 2016. And when they heard that Australia were going to start in 2016, it was a bit like the hockey. They got seriously apoplectic and decided that they'd better get it going because they couldn't bear to be beaten by Australia again. What's the next step? Well, we're consulting with everybody. We're waiting for the government to approve this program, which we think they will. We have an implementation plan. SCRIPT stands for Steering Committee for the Renewal Implementation Project, which I'm chairing until about 2016. It'll kick me off the streets and out of my wife's hair for a while. We have a few things to do, not least of which is communicating all this properly to the community at large and the health professionals in particular. And they're not an easy group, actually, to get the message across. About the people, the community, women, are much easier, I believe, anyway, to talk to than our own colleagues. Our own colleagues are terribly resistant to change. And we have to sort of somehow get it across. I think Terry would agree. They're, they're, it's very tricky, and the people have to deal with them. 
But for you now, the start date for this is 2016. It's business as usual until then. And George Papanicolaou, I think, if he were around today, would say it's very, very reasonable that we um, consider a change at this time. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to ask them. Thanks, Ian. You can see that uh, we've got the right man for the job when it comes to the passion that goes with communicating this message. And uh, I'm just told that Ian's talking to 65 GPs on Wednesday night, so the ball starts uh, rolling here. Uh, folks, we've got uh, a microphone that we'll be travelling around. Alicia will be running to you uh, to record your questions, largely because we're recording this event for those people who can't be here. Uh, so if you have a question, please put your hand up. But if you can wait till the microphone arrives, we'll make sure we'll catch those questions for those who are listening online and through other mechanisms. Questions for Anne? In the middle there. Um, thank you very much for a fantastic talk, um, Professor Hammond. Um, I'm wondering if HPV can be acquired um, from baby onwards. So can HPV be transmitted by the mother or um, exactly how do you get sure. HPV, in other sure. words? Well, I mean, I think... For general, Not just sexually. No, 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 I understand. I mean, the general rule is sexual contact of some sort is, is the usual way trans transmission occurs. But we do know, for example, that a baby uh, born through a birth canal with genital warts can actually get a condition called laryngeal papillomatosis. They can, can get breathing problems from it. It's very, very uncommon, by the way, considering the number of women that will be born through a birth canal that does have some wart virus activity. But... It's uncommon. But the answer is yes, babies can get it, but it's unusual probably to get 16 and 18, which cause genital cancer in that way. Um, and when we were trying... I remember years ago when we were talking to people that were very distressed by finding that they did have an infection. They, they, had, a pap, they had a pap smear, and the pap smear showed virus changes, and they were very nervous about it. So, well, how did I get this? Um, you know, they said, I've been in the same relationship for many, many years. My partner's only had one partner. I've, you know, all that sort of discussion. So how did I get this? It's only sexually transmitted. And there, there will be, I, I'm sure, there will be some women who have contracted the virus from the birth canal from their mother. But as I used to say to the women, I said, you want to go and have this discussion with your mother, you're welcome. You know, I wouldn't be having it. But it, it probably can happen. It certainly happens with actual warts, though. They can certainly be transmitted. It's the same virus, just a different time. Does that answer the question at all? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Go back and forth the room. <laughs> it's an athletic, athletic training program, isn't it? Sort of running around the room. Thanks. Um, your title is a bit misleading to us women. I mean, for the scientists, they might know what you're talking about. But for me, I saw, oh, not, don't need to have a pap smear. This is great. Are you going to do a blood test? But it's not. We still have to have a pap smear. No, you have to have a test taken from the cervix. Yeah, but for exactly, me as a woman... It, absolutely, exactly as I said. What this means for you is every five years you'll be invited to have a test. The test will be exactly the same. You'll have a, that brush-type thing I showed a picture of the... Mm. Pack, that same test will be taken from the cervix, put into the little bottle, shaken around, and that test will go to the laboratory. So for women, it's exactly the same. It's just less frequent. But that's why women don't have these, because... That's why you're getting so, so many women not having them, because it's a horrible procedure. Why aren't you looking at developing tests that don't involve a pap smear through the vagina? Why aren't you trying to do that? Well, I think we are. I mean, I think that the, the fact that there, for example, I mentioned the self-collection test. Remember, most women, 80%, 80% of our population anyway, and it's the same actually in the other states, 80% of women will have a pap smear every five years, within five years. Even if they don't have it within two years, they have it within five years, which leaves 20%. There are some in that 20% that it wouldn't matter whatever you said to them, they would never, ever have a test. They don't want to know about it. They don't, you know, it's, it's like blinkers almost. They don't want to know about those sort of things. And men are very similar with some of the problems too. It's not just women. But there is the business about having the test. Now, most women, most women, um, I'm a... I'm not a woman, I'm going to get into trouble now. But I think that a lot of women will say it, it's uncomfortable, it's not, but it's not usually, for most women, 
painful. Now, there are some, their cervix is exquisitely tender, and when they have a scraping taken, they find it very, very uncomfortable, but they're prepared to sort of take the balances and say, well, I'd rather be protected than not. But I fully understand what you're saying. The answer is no, we don't have a way forward except the swab test taken from the top of the vagina by you yourself. You just put a swab in, take that, can go to the laboratory, and if they find HPV, then you would have to have some cells taken. So it doesn't sort of stop it, but if it was negative, if it was negative, you wouldn't have to have anything done. But at the moment, the test is not good enough doing by yourself to be as efficient as the one from the health practitioner. So we can't recommend that for a national program. Because if we say that as a national program, and you individually say, take that test, and it comes back negative, and a year later you've got cervical cancer, you will turn around and say, well, listen, I took the trouble to take this test, and now look at me, I've got this, this going on. So you'd want to know that it was especially as good as whatever's available. It's a sort of a problem with screening. Screening is the best you can do for the most people for the money we have available in Australia. And to be honest, this is actually, it's not a cost, this is, by the way, the renewal is not a cost-saving measure of any sort. They just say, do what you like, come up with what you like, and we'll tell you whether we can afford it. If it costs the same or 10% more, basically the government will fund it. If it costs 50% more, they'll say, well, we haven't got the money, just like they say everywhere else you want to do something. So I hope I've answered your question, but we haven't got the magic sort of... That would be very nice. Uh, There's no blood um, test anyway. There's no blood test that does it. That's what you really want, I know. Yes, that would be exactly what I'd love. Sure. Um, You're saying you're going to screen just for HPV. What about all the other cancers? Because you're saying it's a HPV test. Sure. Well, we don't... Yeah, there are other cancers, but if you take women's cancers, for example, ovarian cancer, there's no screening... the, The pap smear doesn't do anything for ovarian cancer endometrial cancer, the lining of the womb, the pap smear doesn't screen for that, and vulvar cancer or vaginal cancer, it doesn't screen for that. So the pap smear is, as it was, is directed for cervical cancer, and the HPV test is looking for HPV-related cancers, in particular in the genital tract. See, for a screening program, they have to be fairly common cancers to make it worthwhile screening for them. It doesn't mean the other people who get cancer is not worthwhile. It's just that you can't afford to do it. If they're very rare, you can't afford to do it. So we, we are unable to, to extend that, really, at this moment. Um, thank you very much. I enjoyed your talk very much, too. Um, I, d- t- I have two questions, if that's OK. The first one is, um, was there any success with the blood testing for HPV 16 and 18? in terms of finding out whether people have had the, had the virus. You can do serology on HPV, and you can test they've got a result. You can, you can do that. When they did the trials on the vaccine, you, you know that they've got a result and how long it lasts for. They don't actually know what the blood levels mean in terms of protection. It's not the same as some of the other um, immunisation programmes that have been present. But, yes, you can do that to detect whether you've been infected by the virus. So that's available, but it's not used as a... Um, we don't use it for anything particular. Okay, thank you. And the other question was, um, what's the current protocol for um, vaginal vault smears? What's suggested in that respect? For please? women that have had a hysterectomy? You're yes. Talking? Yeah. yes. Uh, well, it depends why they've had a hysterectomy. If they've had a hysterectomy, say a woman you know, in her 40s and 50s has a hysterectomy for abnormal bleeding and has never had um, a problem with pap smears or anything else, no cytology problems or no treatment of the cervix, the recommendation is that once you've had a hysterectomy, you do not need... Um, to have a vault smear ever, if it was negative. But if you have ever had, this is the current, current practice, if you've ever had changes to the cervix and had treatment to the cervix, for example, CIN3, like that white stuff I showed, the recommendation at the moment is you continue to have smears taken from the vaginal vault every two years, actually just the same, until you reach 69, <laughs> at which time you go away. The, uh, interestingly enough, I think that if you have the HPV program and we know that you've never had HPV, um, we would probably recommend, even if you had a hysterectomy at 35, we'd say, well, don't need to do anything. Except you might meet a partner at 36, uh, have intercourse, get a new virus, and the virus can affect the skin of the vagina as well. So you might need to be screened then. But in ter- that's a personal thing for an individual, but for a population, which we deal with, our general advice would be there is no screening for those people. I don't know if that answers your question, but basically, vault smears are for people that have been treated before, otherwise, after hysterectomy, they don't need it. Sure. Folks, I think time may well have beaten us. 
so what I might do is ask you to join me in thanking Ian for doing such a fabulous job.